Hello, and welcome to today's online event. Before we get started, there are a couple of housekeeping items that we would like to go over. First, we want to make this session as interactive as possible and encourage you to ask questions at any time using the question and answer box located below the slides window. You can also use the question and answer box to get technical assistance. Today's presentation is being presented via web only, so there is no teleconference dial-in. You'll need to make sure that your computer speakers are turned up in order to hear the presenter. You can also fine-tune the audio by using the volume controls inside the media window. The presentation console allows you to interact and customize the layout to fit your viewing experience. You can collapse and expand any window on the console just like you would on your desktop by dragging the corners in or out. In addition, you can also maximize or close any of the windows on your screen by clicking the corresponding icon in the upper right hand corner of each of the windows. At any time, you can reset the console to the default layout and access additional presentation functionality using the widgets at the bottom of the presentation console. I would now like to hand things over to the presenter. So welcome everybody to part three of Take 20, where we're gonna be recapping all of the best of VMworld. And with that, let's just get started with understanding virtual SAN availability features. And before I dive into this, just wanna make sure that you know that if you have questions while we're going through this, please just post them in the chat window and they'll get answered while, uh, while, I'm, while this is in process. So let's get right into it. Talking about virtual SAN objects. So I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time diving into the basics of virtual SAN, just given the limited time that we have. We're just gonna talk specifically about availability. So virtual SAN objects. Virtual SAN is made up of a number of different objects, and those objects are made up of what we call virtual SAN components. Now, the maximum size for each of those components is 255 gigs, and if you have an object, say a VMDK, that's larger than that, it's just gonna be split into multiple components. And then those components are what we're gonna drill into a little bit later as we talk about how vSAN handles availability. So looking at how vSAN handles availability, the idea here is that we need to make sure that vSAN is resilient in the case of failure. So what we're gonna do is for whatever failures to tolerate you have vSAN configured for, and an example would be failures to tolerate equals one, we're going to keep at least two copies of your data. Now, those two copies of the data is gonna allow us to tolerate a failure However, the, the one thing that two copies is not going to do is it's not going to make it clear which component should take over in the case of a split brain scenario. So we're going to introduce a third, uh, another concept, which would be the witness component. And the idea here is that if we don't end up with a odd number of data components, we're going to add a witness component, and that witness component is going to do nothing other than serve as a tiebreaker. The witness component is is not a parity uh, component. It's, it, we're not calculating parity. It's just acting as a tiebreaker if that's something that's need, needed. So another concept that we'll talk about just briefly is erasure coding. So erasure coding is equivalent to something like a RAID 5, if you're familiar with uh, the way that we uh, organize storage from an availability standpoint. So what we're gonna do in, in erasure coding, and we have a, a couple of different versions of it that we can uh, configure with virtual SAN, but we'll talk uh, in this example about a failures to tolerate equals one. So what we're gonna end up with now is we'll have three data components, and then we will actually have a parity component. Uh, and that, in addition to these three components, we, we would also uh, have a, a witness component. So again, you can end up in that position where we have um, where we have a, uh, an odd number of components to allow us to calculate that, that split brain scenario if we run into that situation. So I'm gonna walk you through a demo showing some of the uh, component layout for virtual SAN. And in this case, we're, we're drilling into the virtual SAN and we're gonna look at one particular VM and I'm gonna show you the components of that and then we're going to change the policy and take a look at how that impacts the number of components. So in this case, we have it set for failures to tolerate equals one. You can see we have it as RAID one, two components and a witness component. And now we're gonna go in and we're gonna change the, the VMDK of that VM. We're gonna change that policy to our silver policy. And what that silver policy is, is erasure coding with failures to tolerate equals one. 
And so we're going to see, you, you saw it there that we had a, it showed us what the impact of the change was going to be. And now we can take a look at the actual uh, components and see that we now have four components instead of just the three that we had before. Now let's talk about virtual SAN network partitioning. So what happens if we have any kind of a, an issue with virtual SAN from a networking standpoint? So if we take a look at this, the host that I have highlighted here is network partitioned. So it's had some kind of a network or switch failure resulting in it becoming isolated from the other hosts. And the easiest way that you can see that is if you look at the uh, network partition group on the right hand side, you can see that that highlighted host is now in group two rather than group one like the rest of our hosts. So what's going to happen with virtual SAN if it ends up in a situation like that? Well, virtual SAN is really tightly integrated with uh, vSphere high availability, vSphere HA. And so what's going to happen is if that host is isolated, we're going to shut down the VMs that are on that host because they're not going to be able to operate because they don't have more than 50% of the components in our virtual SAN anyway. And they'll be restarted by HA on another host within our cluster that does have access to more than 50% of those components. So if we take a look here, we can see what it looks like with that, uh, that component missing. We, we have one component absent because that component uh, may have lived on that host that became isolated. And uh, as we recover things, uh, it will, um, the, when that host becomes unisolated again, if it's within our time frame that I'll talk about in just a little bit, that component would come back, otherwise it would need to get rebuilt and vSAN would handle that. So talking about uh, component states. So when we look at losing components within vSAN, there's two different ways that that can be handled, and that's either absent or degraded. So first off, we'll talk about absent. So if a component is marked as absent, the idea there is vSAN is expecting it to come back. So there's, it thinks that there's a good chance that it will, it will return at some point. And some examples of that would be uh, a host is rebooted. Uh, you pull a disk out of a host or you end up in a network partition. And I, I want to emphasize the uh, pulling a disk thing because often when people are evaluating or taking a look at vSAN, one of the things that they'll do is they'll they'll pull a disk out as an I thinking that they're going to simulate a disk failure. And really what you're doing there is vSAN is smart enough to know that that disk didn't fail, it just got pulled. And so what, it, what it's thinking is you may have just pulled the wrong disk. And so it's expecting that disk to return. Now what vSAN is going to do is it's, it's not going to wait forever for those components to come back. It's just going to wait for about 60 minutes so that give you time for either the host to come back up, the network partition event to resolve itself, or for you to reinsert that disk, and then it will just continue on in its normal operations. If that 60 minute time period passes, then what it's gonna do is it's going to rebuild that component on uh, another available uh, disk or disk group within the vSAN. So another example is, uh, another component state is if a component is marked as degraded. And the, the main one there is if we have a failed disk. And what vSAN is going to do is it's going to keep an eye on the, uh, the performance of that disk and monitor to see if it's having problems. And if it does have problems, then it will mark that component as failed or degraded, and it will immediately start a rebuild process on another disk because we're not expecting, once a disk fails, we're not expecting that disk to improve itself. That, now that may happen, but that's not normally the expectation. Next, let's get into vSAN fault domains. And the first thing that I want to talk about here is, is the idea that within a vSAN, each host, at, at a basic level, each host is considered a fault domain. So we have an implicit fault domain within each host. And the idea of a fault domain is that from the standpoint of a failure to tolerate, standpoint, uh, each host would be that failure to tolerate. So 
you know, if we have four hosts uh, in our environment and we have our, our components uh, split up among them, um, I as long as we're using failures to tolerate equals one, uh, we can tolerate the, the failure of a single host. I actually, in that case, we could tolerate the failure of two hosts uh, and, and not impact our, uh, the, the running of our VMs. And where the f idea of fault domains is important is we can expand this idea of fault domains to multiple hosts. And where that's important is, let's say that you have uh, multiple server racks. So, and each of those server racks is served normally by two power units or by a top of rack switch, or maybe even a pair of top of rack switches. But we want to make sure that if we have a failure that, that encompasses a entire rack, that vSAN is not going to be negatively impacted. And so if we define the hosts that a rack contains as a fault domain, what that will do is vSAN will make sure that the components in your vSAN environment are spread out among those fault domains just like they would have been from a host standpoint. And that will make sure that if we have a failure of, you know, in this example, let's say that we have uh, uh, four racks, or even just say let's we, ha we had three, and we had failures to tolerate set to one, if we lose one of those racks, vSAN is gonna continue to function as before and you know, we're not gonna lose any data or negatively impact our VMs. So drilling a little bit more into detail about fault domains and failures to tolerate. So there's you know, a number of different ways that we can configure vSAN. We can configure it either uh, in a mirroring configuration, you know, which is kind of a RAID 1, in which case, you know, if you're setting failures to tolerate equals one, you're gonna need at least three fault domains. Failures to tolerate is two, you're gonna need five, and three, you're gonna need seven. For erasure coding, it's a little bit different. So if we have failures to tolerate set to, set to one, we're gonna need at least four fault domains. And if we set it to two, that's gonna require six. And you'll note that if we want failures to tolerate to equal three, that's currently not supported. And the reason for that is that the, the availability that you're providing yourself by doing that, and I, I could show you the numbers, but it, it gets really boring, the, the, the availability that you're providing yourself by adding that additional failures to tolerate is you're getting past the, the availability of the disks and the hosts and things like that themselves, and there really isn't any additional value that you're adding by supporting that higher uh, failures to tolerate with erasure coding. So talking about recommendations for fault domains, ideally you would want to have a host available for rebuilds. So while you could, if you're using failures to tolerate equals one with RAID one, you could just have three hosts. If you ended up in a situation where you had a problem with one of your hosts or you needed to take it down for an extended period of time, there's, you don't have an additional place for your components to get rebuilt. So having four hosts in, if you're wanting to use failures to tolerate equals one, having four hosts or four fault domains just gives you that extra level of availability. Let's talk a little bit about maintenance mode. So Virtual SAN supports maintenance mode just like regular hosts within a vSphere cluster. However, since vSAN is dealing with data components, we have a little bit of additional complexity on top of the idea of maintenance mode. So this is what the maintenance mode window looks like within virtual SAN. I'm gonna go through this and just show you some examples of what it looks like. So here's our, our before state. So we have uh, four hosts or four failure domains, however we wanna think about that. Let's, let's just call it four hosts. And we have two VMs. Uh, we have one VM that's set for failures to tolerate equals one, and one with failures to tolerate equals zero. And you can see that we have, uh, for our failures to tolerate equals one, we have two data components, and we have one witness component, which is that smaller dot. And we have two data components that are both on that first host, the one on the left. So if we wanna put that host into maintenance mode, and we use the ensure accessibility option, then what vSAN is going to do is it's going to move the data component for our VM that had failures to tolerate zero, so that just had a single data component. It's gonna move that, but it's gonna leave the other data component on that host that's going down for maintenance mode. And the idea here is, is that we wanna ensure that that data is accessible. 
and but we don't want to move any additional data. So we're expecting this host to be down for a short period of time, and we just don't want to impact our VM's availability, our, our VM's accessibility. The, the next thing that we can look at is a full data migration, and that's pretty self-explanatory. We're just going to copy whatever data is on that host onto other hosts within the environment so that there, there's no VM data living on that, on, on that host anymore, and we can take that host down. Now, this is something that you'd want to use if we were going to be replacing that host, taking it out of the environment permanently, or if it was going to be down for an extended period of time. Another option that we could use is no data migration. And you can see that in this option, both of the components for both of our VMs are no longer going to be available. Now, the downside with this is this would make that one of our VMs unavailable. The failures to tolerate equals, equals zero, since it has just that single component, that VM is no longer going to be available if we took this option. Uh, and you'd probably only want to use this if you were okay tolerating that downtime and or if just the cost to you of moving data around was significant. So that, that walks through the three different methods uh, that vSEN has of dealing with uh, maintenance mode. Next, let's talk about drive and host failures. And I've got one more demo for you uh, at the end of this section. So we talked before about uh, components being degraded versus absent. And vSAN has some capabilities where it's going to monitor both cache and capacity devices. And it's going to keep an eye on those for both errors and latency. Now, we have some improvements in how vSAN handles this in vSAN 6.2 compared with 6.1. vSAN 6.1 was just going to simply look for uh, sustained periods of high latency. Now, in vSAN 6.2, we have a lot more intelligence built into it. So it's not going to unmount something if we have a lot of read latency, and it's not going to unmount a caching device if we have excessive write latency. Uh, what it is going to do is it's going to track excessive latency over multiple random periods of time to keep an eye on things, and if it if a disk ends up being unmounted because it was unhealthy, it will try and remount that at peri over periods of time just to see if whatever the issue was has been resolved within that disk. Now, if you use, if you have drive failure and you're utilizing deduplication and compression with vSAN 6.2, that can have different impacts depending on if you're utilizing those features or not. So if you're not using dedupe and compression, and you have a capacity drive that fails, then that drive is just going to be unmounted. The disk group on that host is going to stay online. Now, obviously, the exception to that is if you just had a single capacity drive within that disk group, in which case, you, if the, that single capacity drive goes down, regardless of whether you're using deduplication or compression, that disk group is going to be unavailable. If a cache device fails, regardless, that entire disk group is going to become, uh, is going to be unmounted. Now, if you are using deduplication and compression, keep in mind that if a cache or capacity drive, uh, drive fails, then that entire disk group is going to become unmounted. And that's because of the, the, the additional things that we're having to do from a dedupe and compression standpoint uh, necessitates that. So just something to keep in mind when you're planning out your environment. So let's take a look at another demo. Here we're going to take a look at what happens when we fail one of our hosts. So we can see we, we took a quick look at the VMs that were running on that, on that host, and this is one particular VM. Now we're going to power off that, that one host and see how that impacts things in our web client. So we can see now that, that the one host is unavailable, and we can see that our VM is actually still running. And the reason for that is it's actually not still running. It's, it's that HA already restarted it. And we can see if we look at the components of that VM, we can see that we have that one absent component, but otherwise our environment was performing normally. You know, HA handled that restart really quickly, and then we're back up to where we wanted to be. Now we restarted that, uh, that host that we'd powered off, and we can take a look and see that now all of our components, are, again, are present, and there was no further impact to our VM. So that concludes my session for the today. I uh, hope you enjoyed that and got something out of it. Again, uh, please ask any questions in the chat box, and we'll get those answered. Thank you very much.